Acid-catalyzed hydration of an alkyne involves the addition of OH and H across the atoms of an alkyne. This gives rise initially to an enol intermediate. However, under the acidic reaction conditions, the enol is unstable with respect to an isomer in which there's a carbon-oxygen double bond, the so-called keto form. In this video, we'll examine the mechanism of acid-catalyzed hydration of alkynes, which is a very traditional type 1 mechanism involving a vinyl carbocation. We'll also explore the reasons why this conversion of the enol to the keto form occurs spontaneously through a process known as tautomerization. Mechanistically, tautomerization is very simple. It just involves a couple of proton transfers, and for this reason, it reaches equilibrium very rapidly and is thermodynamically controlled. This means that we can use the relative stabilities of the enol and keto forms and quantitative thermodynamic data like bond dissociation energies to understand why one form is favored over the other. Markovnikov type addition across the atoms of an alkyne would be expected to give a product in which OH is connected to the more substituted carbon and H to the less substituted carbon. And of course, this is only relevant for terminal alkynes in which the terminal carbon has a different substitution pattern than the internal carbon. This amounts to Markovnikov selectivity since the nucleophile OH is connected to the more substituted position in the product. And this intermediate is called an enol because it contains an alkene, a carbon-carbon double bond, connected to a hydroxyl group, part of an alcohol. So it contains the structural elements of both an alcohol and an alkene connected directly to one another. The enol isn't the final product in acid-catalyzed hydrations of alkynes. Under the reaction conditions, it converts rapidly into an isomeric product known as the keto form. Notice that the difference here is that the OH group is now simply a doubly bound oxygen, and the CH2 group on the end of the alkene in the enol is now a CH3 group. A hydrogen has migrated from oxygen to carbon. We'll come back to the mechanism of how this occurs, but for the time being, let's focus on how we arrive at the enol. The enol is formed as an intermediate in this reaction mechanism. And it's a pretty traditional type 1 mechanism, as I've called it in the past, involving the formation of a vinyl cation now. So the mechanism is exactly analogous to acid-catalyzed hydration of alkenes, at least until we reach the enol stage. The first elementary step is protonation of the pi bond. This results in a vinyl cation, an sp hybridized cation. And because the more substituted cation is more stable, this step occurs selectively to give the more substituted cation. The first step also generated water, which in the second step of the mechanism coordinates to the cationic carbon in an A sub n or nucleophile association elementary step. Notice that the direction of approach of the water here is irrelevant to the outcome of the reaction since the alkene has a CH2 group on the other end, meaning there's no cis-trans issue here. This molecule doesn't have a cis or trans isomer. To reach the enol intermediate and regenerate the acid catalyst, the final step here is proton transfer from the protonated enol, which is this intermediate we generated via this A sub n step, to water. This gives the enol and H3O plus, as it must since this reaction is acid catalyzed. Just briefly, it's worth noting that this fits our paradigm of acid catalysis that we've seen previously, where two proton transfer steps bookend at the beginning and end of the mechanism, a key elementary step occurring in the middle. The enol is unstable with respect to an isomeric molecule readily generated under these acidic reaction conditions. On the next slide, we'll see how this works and why the isomer, the keto form, is more stable than the enol form. The process that converts enols into carbonyl compounds, such as ketones, is referred to as tautomerization. The keto and enol forms are constitutional isomers, but this particular type of relationship in which the only difference between the structures is the movement of a hydrogen from a heteroatom to carbon is called tautomerism, and the molecules are referred to as tautomers of one another. Let's start by looking at the mechanism. Tautomerization does not involve the internal migration of a hydrogen atom from oxygen to carbon. Instead, it has to be catalyzed by either acid or base. We're going to focus on acid catalysis here, since acid-catalyzed hydration is a very important context for tautomerization, but you'll see tautomerization occurring in a basic context in other reactions in your Organic Chemistry 2 course. In essence, when tautomerization occurs, 
net hydrogen transfer is accomplished via the protonation of one atom and the deprotonation of another. Since where we're headed, we need to add a hydrogen to carbon, the first step of this reaction is protonation of this carbon. So this curved arrow coming from the carbon-carbon double bond is meant to show the formation of a new CH bond. The resulting intermediate contains a positive charge at its central carbon, but the positively charged carbon is adjacent to an oxygen atom. This means that the positive charge is shared by both oxygen and carbon. And this alternative resonance form makes the point that that oxygen is now connected to a quite acidic proton. We generated water during the first proton transfer step, and water can be used as a base in a second proton transfer step to remove hydrogen from the oxygen atom. This generates the ketone product and also regenerates the catalyst, H3O+. Both of these proton transfer steps are rapid and reversible, and so this overall process is an equilibrium. That's why we've used a double arrow here. But just to draw your attention to this one more time, I want to make the point that mechanistically, this reaction is very simple. It's a proton transfer to the atom that picks up a hydrogen, followed by a proton transfer from the atom that loses a hydrogen. And while we won't look at the base catalyzed mechanism in detail, just to give a little teaser here, the order of events is reversed under base catalysis. A proton is removed first, and then a proton is added in the second proton transfer step. Because the reaction reaches equilibrium very quickly, because it just involves proton transfer, the reaction is thermodynamically controlled, and so we can ask about the relative stability of the keto and enol forms. What we observe in practice is that the keto form is generally favored, and this means that it's more stable thermodynamically than the enol form. This should make sense. With a small number of exceptions, we haven't seen any carbon-carbon double bonds connected to OH groups. On the other hand, CO double bonds are very common. To understand the reason why the keto form is favored, one good place to start is with bond dissociation enthalpies. We can calculate a rough delta H for the change in enthalpy in going from the enol to the keto form by adding up the bond dissociation enthalpies of the bonds broken in this process, the CC double bond and the OH bond, and subtracting from that the bond dissociation enthalpies of the bonds made, the carbon-oxygen double bond. And notice that this is a big driver of what's going on. This is considerably larger than the other bond dissociation enthalpies here, and the sp3 CH bond. The result here is negative 5 kilocalories per mole, indicating that the enol form is more stable than the keto form by about 5 kilocalories per mole. The difference isn't huge, but it's enough to bias the keto form significantly over the enol form in the majority of cases. There are some exceptions to this, though, and there can be a fine balance between the keto and enol forms. For our purposes, we're going to constrain ourselves in Chem 2311 to situations where the keto form is clearly favored over the enol form, with one important exception that's worth mentioning in case you think about it later, which is the case of phenols or phenols. Phenol is an enol. It contains a carbon-carbon double bond linked directly to a hydroxyl group. And there is a keto form of a phenol that looks like this. When it comes to this equilibrium, the enol form is heavily favored over the keto form because the enol form is aromatic, but the keto form is not, since it contains an sp3 hybridized carbon with four bonds in the middle of the ring. We'll discuss this in more detail in later discussions of aromaticity, but I wanted to bring it to your attention now in case you start wondering about phenols, which do in fact contain the enol functional group. In general, it's worth keeping in mind at this point that the keto form of a carbonyl compound, which actually contains the carbon-oxygen double bond, is generally more stable than the enol form, and so we should avoid drawing enol forms when a more stable keto form exists. A big driver for the favorability of the keto form is the remarkable stability of the carbon-oxygen double bond, as exemplified quantitatively by its bond dissociation enthalpy. Why is the carbon-oxygen double bond so darn strong? One thing to note is, it's a multiple bond, and so it's going to get strength from both the sigma and pi bonds. But that doesn't explain this 12 kilocalorie per mole difference between C double bond C and C double bond O. The alternative resonance structure of the carbon-oxygen double bond, in which carbon is positive and oxygen is negative, is actually quite an important contributor to the nature of this bond. And it gives the bond some ionic character, since a negatively charged oxygen is linked to a positively charged carbon. 
that electrostatic attraction between these opposite charges is actually a significant contributor to this bond dissociation enthalpy. And it makes carbon-oxygen double bonds and carbon-nitrogen double bonds involving polarization generally stronger than nonpolar bonds like C double bond C.